from commissioners. Uh, we have three meetings this evening, uh, Sustainability Committee, Building and Planning Committee, and Special Board of Commissioners. And just want to remind all the person in our audience tonight that uh, before we start, please silence your cell phone. Uh, amplifying equipment for uh, the, those having difficulty hearing is available. And when the floor is open for public comment, please use that podium over there and please limit your comments to three minutes. And since there's not too many people here, I won't keep going on. Um, so our first meeting of the evening is our sustainability committee, and I will turn it over to uh, the vice chairperson of our sustainability committee, Commissioner Gilda Kramer. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, there are two matters on our agenda tonight. Um, the first is that we would like to um, acknowledge the recipients of the Environmental Advisory Council's Go for the Green Awards um, for excellence in the sustainability field. Um, the Joseph A. M. Manko Lifetime Achievement Award uh, went to Brian K. Hoppe, who was the former chair of the Environmental Advisory Council. Um, the Mackey San Miguel Paulson Sustainability Award to Joe Cosgrove. Um, to, for an individual resident, it, we honored uh, Michelle Detweiler. Commercial business recipient was Mom's Organic Market um, for educational, um, the LMSD Oakwell Student Movement. For neighbors working together, Leslie Simon, Eric Satlow, Paul Lankin, Peter Stein, David Galinsky, Galinsky and Drew Conry Murray. For friend of the Penns Woods, Dan Mercer. For government service, Samantha Bryant. And honorable mention went to Shift Sustainable Goods and Services. The item of business tonight is um, receipt um, of our sustainability plan. And I move that we consider for recommendation to the Board of Commissioners receiving the sustainability plan dated May 31st, 2023. Is there a second? Thank you. Acting President <laughs> <laughs> Um And now I'd like to ask our marvelous sustainability manager, Paloma Villa, uh, to provide some background information about our sustainability plan. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, so the first, sustainability, the first draft of the sustainability plan was presented at the sustainability committee meeting on March 29th, 2023. Um, most of the feedback at that meeting was more about um, implementation of the plan, um, especially uh, you know, conveying the plan and actionable steps to the public, um, giving extra consideration to vulnerable populations, highlighting the sustainability work that the township has already done and is currently doing, um, prioritizing and identifying uh, the first projects to be implemented, and developing cost-benefit analysis for uh, selected projects. And then in between meetings, we received some feedback from the public and community stakeholders. A lot of it was about formatting and readability of the document, especially issues with color contrast and printing. And then there was also um, some comments about a desire for more context and background information um, and emphasis on certain items. So draft 2.0 really reflects more of cleaning up and adding to um, rather than changing draft 1.0. Um, most of the revisions are related to clarifying language, correcting typographical errors, and altering some of the format to improve readability. Um, it is designed to be an electronic document, but with that being said, several people have expressed a desire to print it, so we changed some of the formatting um, to make it easier to read when printed, things like that. Um, and then some minor components of some of the strategies um, that were deemed to be not feasible by staff were removed. but. All of the implementation strategies, all the re recommendations remain the same um, with no substantive changes. Um, the most significant changes were to the background section. Um, so some helpful information and graphics came out from the IPCC and project drawdown between, um, between revisions. 
and those um, support the approach, recommendations, and priorities of the plan, so they were added to the background section sort of to color the, the discussion and um, provide more information. And then more discussion and figures were added um, to that background section just to improve the reader's understanding of some of the concepts um, that were discussed or that come up throughout the plan. Um, and then the greenhouse gas forecast that was being worked on when I presented draft 1.0 was completed and added to um, that section of the background. Uh, the glossary has also been added to Appendix B um, of the plan. Um, as you would expect, it defines the terms of art that are used in the plan, um, but each definition also contains a link to more information about that topic. So even as a standalone document, it's, it's pretty useful to um, learn more about the multitude of sustainability topics that are, that are uh, throughout the plan. And uh, gives a little bit of con more context as well as to what was recommended and why. Um, and then the attachments were also added, which are really just the studies that were performed by the various students from um, 2021 through 2023, um, the RISE students, the LCAP students, and all that. So those can all be um, found as well. So that, that's pretty much a summary of draft 2.0. Um, and then I'll be working with um, LMTV, the P um, public information officer, the AC, and community stakeholders um, on the community education and outreach piece of things as we move forward. Um, and I expect to work with the Sustainability Committee, Township staff, Township engineer um, in the coming months to begin identifying the first phase of projects to be implemented and performing those cost-benefit analysis to present to you all and um, for your approval. So, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Um, I do want to mention that uh, this item is going to go on the special board of commissioners meeting. So. Um, if members of the public have any comment, this is a good time to make it. And after that, we'll have commissioner comment and questions, if any. If you, for public comment, you can come over to the podium. Y'all were super timely. Um, first, I'd just like to express my appreciation um, for. Excuse me, but oh, would sorry. you mind? Um, oh, my name, yourself? yes. <laughs> Apologies. And would you mind speaking closer to the microphone? Very tall, so I'll try. And you can pick it up. <laughs> I could. Here we go. Hi, Maggie Epstein. I live in Bryn Mawr. And first, I would like to express my appreciation for Commissioner Kramer and the entire board for their attention and work on these important issues. Thank you to our township staff, especially to Mr. McNeely as township manager, and to Paloma for her work putting this plan together, but also to everyone who contributed. It's an impressive document, factual, thoughtful, and clearly the result of great effort. And I say that as someone who's taught environmental science for many years, this is A plus work. <laughs> really enjoyed reading it. Right now, today, as we're all seeing, smelling and breathing the effects of climate change, as wildfires in Canada impact our air here, these fires will continue to increase in frequency and in intensity. I'm not even gonna read this. So, today our students are gonna go out to play. If you're waiting for the train, it was burning your eyes. We, climate change isn't an imminent threat. It's the reality we live in. I could go on about that, but I'm just gonna trust that everyone in this room sees climate change as the critical task, the critical problem we need to face. The value in this sustainability plan is that it confronts environmental degradation on multiple fronts, while being mindful of cost and effort and presents real actionable solutions. It also engages all members of the community, homeowners, township employees, business owners, and is incentive-based. Focusing on positive action and positive outreach is exactly what's needed. I'm excited for the board to receive this plan and even more excited to see it implemented. And I encourage the board to move with urgency, but to also embrace the hopeful, positive growth mindset attitude that this document is written in. I hope as a community, we can see it not as a challenge, but as a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. That's it. Any other public comment? Jody, is there anybody waiting? Um, there is no one with their hand raised online. Is there any commissioner comment or any commissioner questions? I'd just like to thank everybody who was involved in this great undertaking. I know it's been a lot of work, and I'm, I'm also excited to see it implemented. So thank you. Is there any other comment? 
Commissioner Zellov. Thank you, Commissioner Kramer. Um, <clears throat> before us tonight is uh, a plan that's uh, been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, the work of many, uh, and, and, and thanks are due to all those who devoted time and energy to putting it together. <clears throat> What's before us is receipt of a plan, of the plan. It's not acceptance of the plan. It's not approval of the plan. Um, this is the plan. It has got so much information. Um, uh, some of us may have read all of it and understand all of it. I am not in that category. Um, uh, I'm not sure all of the public is either. Um, since we have the plan presented to us uh, a few months ago, at every civic meeting that I go to, and that's at three a month, oh. I ask, please read the plan. It's easy to find, and please let us know your comments. Um, I'm still waiting. Um, I, and, and it's really not because people aren't interested. I think they're very interested. There's a lot to this plan. It is going to take us a while, I think, as individuals and as a board to work our way through it. And I look forward to that. Um, we have to prioritize. Um, there's, in a, there's some prioritization here, but there's a lot of work to do there. Um, and the plan is all is evolved already, right? We've got several changes from when we looked at it, you know, a few months ago. Um, and <clears throat> my understanding is that we're going to evaluate it in pieces and make determinations um, how to implement, right? And Paloma, you did say about implementation for the board to consider implementation in pieces that make sense. Um, we're going to look at cost-benefit analysis, as you said. Um, we're going to, you know, it's a significant, it's really a menu, right? And there's a lot on the menu to digest. And, you know, I look forward to that process. But I don't know if it's two years, ten years, it's going to take, I don't know what the time frame is. I don't know if anybody can say. It's going to take us a while to work our way through it. But um, you'll but be here. Yeah. Um, well, Rick, hopefully you will be too. Um, and so it, it, is, uh, it is a remarkable document to begin the process. And it's actually, of course, we're not beginning the document. Uh, very, very well uh, documents what we've done. And we've done a lot. And there's a lot more to do. And we're going we're gonna to work our way through it. So. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kramer. Thank you. Are there any other commissioner yeah. coming? Yeah, thank Commissioner you very much, Kramer. Commissioner Kramer. And, and I would uh, echo all the thanks to all the people that, that did this. If we started listing them, it would be like an Academy Awards program, mm -hmm. and we'd go on endlessly, and we'd still, mi still miss somebody. But I wasn't going to say anything until I was listening to Commissioner Zeloff, because the document itself addresses the point that you, you just raised. And while it may be difficult to breathe outside, this is considered a living, breathing document. And it states in its opening, the sustainability plan is an aspirational, dynamic document that will evolve over time to reflect changing technologies, environmental conditions, and the goals of the Board of Commissioners and the community. It will span many years and require periodic adjustments. And that's exactly what we have. We have this excellent base with a lot of aspirational, important things to consider. And there is no doubt that over time we will, you know, calling audibles as necessary in order to implement this. And, and thanks for all. I look forward to receiving this and uh, starting the work that it outlines for us. Thank you. Commissioner O'Neill. Oh, thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and not to echo, I won't echo, but I'm echoing. Um, everybody um, has said similar comments to what's on my mind, true, truly. And I think what in part what this shows is that when you have a committed group of volunteers led by full-time staff who have an understanding of the needs of a municipality that really great things can be accomplished and spelled out for next step this doesn't mean that every and, and the committee knows i don't agree with everything in the plan i feel like a part of it is actually really far-reaching but it is something that is aspirational that we need to respect the fact that the process was so inclusive of so many different 
um, viewpoints that got us to a, a, the version that we see now, which is actually scaled down a bit. Some of it was really far reaching, and this is a grasp that I think is reasonable for a municipality to ever think about because we are not made of venture funding, we're not a private corporation and provo, so we have to be mindful as to what is uh, the most prudent um, for the residents within the township. Um, this will be paid for by their tax dollars, so um, I, I appreciate your work. Any other comments from commissioners? Well, in that case, then I would like to have the last word. <laughs> Um, developing this sustainability plan has been a several year process and I want to thank the Environmental Advisory Council for initially undertaking this project in late 2018 or early 2019 and all of the residents who worked on the project including David Richmond who spearheaded it and the scores of people who worked in the subcommittees. I want to thank Paloma for undertaking this project almost two years ago and involving stakeholders throughout the community to bring it to this magnificent closure <laughs> that it's a wonderful document. I want to thank John Lesher from the county for his invaluable advice and Ray Courtney and Tiffany for all of their work with me on the sustainability committee. Um, the members of the Environmental Advisory Council, including Nancy Winkler, who has been chairing it now, and Mitchell Burek, and the working groups for their tireless efforts on this project, and the whole community for its support of this important living document, a roadmap to transforming our community into a more sustainable community for the future. As we struggle today with hazardous air quality and smoke from the wildfires in Canada fueled by climate change, I look forward to continuing to work with everyone to implement the plan and reach our important sustainability goals as quickly as possible. And now I'd like to call the vote. All in favor of receiving this plan, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 And anybody opposed, or is it unanimous? It's unanimous. Wonderful. And that concludes the business of our Sustainability Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Kramer, for that very important meeting, and I'm very excited for how that vote turned out. We will now, we will now turn to our uh, Building and Planning Committee, and I call on its chair, uh -huh. Commissioner Josh Grimes. Thank you, Acting President. We have four items on the agenda tonight. Um, as with the uh, sustainability agenda, uh, it is anticipated that each item we're taking up tonight will be also be considered at the special Board of Commissioners meeting immediately following, I think, this committee. So if anyone cares to stay for that reason, uh, please do. Uh, the first item is on page two of our agendas. Um, this is an authorization to advertise an ordinance for some minor amendments to the historic resource inventory. So I am going to call, oh, Greg Pritchard is right there. I don't have to call on him. I'll just ask Greg to speak up and uh, let us know what uh, this is about. Hey, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Good evening, everyone. I have a couple of slides I'd like to show you this evening. Uh, so yes, this is um, a, <clears throat> just a moment, there we go. Okay, this is um, an ordinance to um, amend the historic resource inventory with several, um, as you said, minor uh, cleanups. Um, we have been reviewing the entire historic resource inventory, um, which is over a thousand um, listings. Um, over the past couple of years, actually, um, trying to determine how it can be improved and how uh, mistakes um, can be corrected and updates can be made. Um, during that process, we identified uh, 10 or more different types of changes that um, uh, need to be made to uh, various items on the list. And uh, we split them into uh, kind of two phases. Um, phase one is on the agenda this evening. Um, it consists of three different uh, sections, three different kinds of 
um, updates that I will um, explain now. And uh, these are ones that we, we, are, we consider to be the quote unquote easy changes. These are the, um, the mistakes, the administrative corrections as our solicitor called them, and, um, and another category involving Suburban Square that I'll get into. Uh, so section one is what we call clerical errors. Um, they are simple edits such as misspelled street names, incorrect directional designations, incorrect HRI ID numbers, and uh, some other address changes. Um, section two is deletions, that's nine addresses, um, redundant or retired addresses, and uh, none of which apply to active addresses. And finally, section three, um, additions uh, regarding Suburban Square, um, uh, adding their contributing um, addresses, the addresses of contributing buildings within that complex, rather. Uh, so starting with section one, here is a um, part of the list of the um, uh, properties, addresses that uh, will, would be changed. Uh, so it's mostly simple things like uh, Mary Watersford Road being, um, you know, two words instead of three words, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, there are, are also a number of HRI um, ID numbers that uh, should be edited, um, just very basic um, things like that. Um, there, there are a couple of instances where um, the address numbers are actually changing, and I wanted to briefly go over that. Um, first of all, Anderson Avenue, um, there are a couple of properties there. This is within the Ardmore um, Station Historic District. Um, there are some properties that um, are part of a larger parcel that faces West Lancaster Avenue. Um, so up on the screen, uh, pars the, the entire parcel is designated as 3 West Lancaster Avenue. That's because all of the buildings are owned by the same entity. Um, they uh, use the address of the building facing, fronting on West Lancaster Avenue, but it does consist of a number of buildings that are all connected. They all um, share party walls, and uh, but they are distinct buildings, and they have been identified as distinct buildings in the inventory, and uh, will continue to be done, continue to be identified as such. Um, however, uh, the, those address numbers were um, d did not seem to pertain to the actual mailing addresses of those properties. So, for example. Um, the building uh, directly behind the brick building on the corner um, was listed as 4 Anderson Avenue. Um, the um, two storefronts within that building are 2 and 6 Anderson Avenue, so we are just seeking to change that number 4 into 2-6. And uh, similar with the other building um, directly behind it, um, which, is, which was listed in the inventory as simply 8 Anderson Avenue. Um, it contains two mailing addresses, 8 and 10, so we'd like to include both of those in that single um, uh, listing for that um, inventory item. Um, another instance is uh, 453 um, Duck Pond Lane, which is actually um, a <laughs> large portion of the Haverford College campus. Um, the uh, building, the, the historic building, um, on this campus is the, uh, the former Haverford Grammar School. This is actually where ha the Haverford School began in this building fronting on um, Old Railroad Avenue. Um, so again, the parcel is actually 453 Duck Pond Lane, but it's um, listed in the inventory as simply 8 Old Railroad Avenue. Um, there are actually two mailing addresses for that building for each section of it, um, 8 and 10, and so we'd like to change that designation to 8-10 Old Railroad Avenue. So those are just kind of the most complicated, um, uh, or examples of the most complicated kinds of edits within that first section. Um, section 2 are uh, deletions. Um, now we have another section of uh, properties and historic resources that have been completely demolished and that will have to go through a more intensive process in the next phase of this cleanup. But um, we did identify a number of addresses that are simply not real addresses. They, um, some of them are redundant with other addresses that are in the inventory. And uh, we've done thorough research into each of these and determined that they either um, don't pertain to um, actual places in the township, there's no uh, entry in the database for um, the properties to describe them, or that uh, there are confirmable um, alternate addresses for these um, resources that um, should be cited instead of these. And the third and final category is Suburban Square. Now, 
The uh, street view image on the screen is a perfect example of why we feel this is necessary. Uh, currently, uh, the uh, suburban square complex is listed on the inventory under a single address, which is the address of one of the parcels that makes up the complex. Um, but within that complex are historic buildings that are contributing to the overall character of Suburban Square and others that are not, that were built much more recently. And um, the uh, two uh, buildings on the screen, uh, as, as viewed from St. George's um, across Montgomery Avenue, um, is a perfect example. The Historical Commission actually just recently reviewed um, changes to the building on the right. And um, the building on the left was built much later and uh, we don't feel that it's necessary for the commission to have to review every change to buildings like the one on the left, like if a new business comes in and changes out their sign or uh, if uh, they want to apply a new facade material. Um, we feel that um, um, it's only really necessary for the commission to be reviewing changes to those historic buildings, the original Art Deco limestone facade buildings within uh, the Suburban Square campus. And uh, so we actually worked with uh, Kimco Realty on this to um, determine the uh, mailing addresses for each of what we consider to be the contributing buildings within Suburban Square. So up on the screen is, is a map showing um, the, what we consider the contributing buildings in blue and uh, the non-contributing in gray. Um, as you can see, the, the number and the, the, the overall footprints of the non-contributing buildings is much, much larger than those that are contributing. Um, so that's uh, a good reason we thought this was necessary. Now, we, we are leaving in that um, parcel address as one of the um, uh, main addresses um, in this um, overall um, change because we feel that if um, there is some kind of new construction on the property, like uh, for example the construction of the pavilion in the center of the courtyard that's used by Lola's Garden, we feel that um, it would be necessary for the Commission to review um, items like that to assess their potential impact on the contributing buildings. Um, so the list that we came up with um, is on the screen. Um, so those first two entries are for the parcel designations for the uh, suburban square complex and all the rest are for those individual buildings um, including the uh, Times building, the, the tall skyscraper in the middle. And uh, that is all I have and I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure, so before I open this up to other commissioners, just a, a, a quick question. Uh, were the street names were, were correct? corrected, revised, amended. Um, what database did you use to determine what the correct names of the streets were? Yeah, we went by the county database, actually the township database, which draws its information from the official county um, designations. Okay, as opposed to like, for instance, I noticed there's an East River Road now. Uh, I wasn't aware there, were, there was an East or a West <laughs> River Road. If that's what it is, it's what it is. Uh, uh, that was a surprise to me too, but that is the, uh, according to the official database, that is the official address. Okay, thanks. So, Commissioner, questions, comments? Okay, before we open a public comment, I am going to move to recommend to the Board of Commissioners authorizing the Township Secretary to advertise a public hearing and notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend the code of the Township of Lower Marion, Chapter A180, Historic Resource Inventory, to modify listed addresses by correcting spellings and other minor errors to improve consistency with the Township's official address listing, to remove duplicate, redundant, and inactive addresses, and to add specific addresses in Suburban Square. Is there a, a second? Thank you, Acting President Gavron. Um, so we'll now open this up to public comment. Please. Maura Gillen, Haverford. Um, I do appreciate this effort. Um, there's a lot of additional work that can be done with historic preservation, and it starts with knowing what we're preserving. Um, in particular, making it easy to identify uh, the exact location of the enumerated historic resources is a start point. Um, this is not yet completely consistent with our Montgomery County property records, but I understand why, and I think you've identified some good compromises there, where the property record is gonna show three Lancaster, but we have to identify something um, by an address. Um, but I do wanna be clear. 
the historic resource inventory is not comprised of addresses. The inventory is the database. If you read our code, there's no such thing as an internal database. The database is specifically referenced in A180. And it's maybe not as clearly written, there's a little bit of a misplaced modifier, but if you parse that sentence, what it says is that the inventory is comprised of the resources, building sites, structures, and objects, as described in the database and located at these addresses set forth below. The database is incorporated by reference wholly into our code. You can't just say that the database is some internal database that we use when we need it. I believe you, uh, Commissioner Grimes talked about the database at the workshop recently because we sort of lost it. Um, it's not currently publicly available. Now you can always email Greg, as I do regularly, and get whichever HRI you want. And in fact, I got, we do HRI, we use historic resource inventory, and we use as historic resource information. Uh, the database entries. This HRI entry is the one for Suburban Square, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but the inventory is those building sites, structures and objects enumerated and located at those addresses. Appreciate the effort to properly identify the addresses where those are located. Um, yes, it needs to be available for public inspection. I have a challenge with the addresses for Suburban Square because we are adding um, addresses and there's a couple of pieces there I've said this before if you're going to add an address to the list located at a 180 you also have to be presenting to the public as part of this discussion the database entry that would describe the building site structure or object being protected under this historic resource inventory the address is not the inventory the building site structures and objects, the resources are the inventory, and that database has to be presented in order for us to know what we're protecting. I have a concern with the fact that the, the one database entry for Suburban Square lists, identifies, enumerates two buildings, the skyscraper that was home to the mainline daily and the Strawbridge and Clothier department store, and then it says in sort of vague terms, a series of buildings. But if we're going to add those 16 buildings at those addresses, that ought to be a specific public process that goes through the Historical Commission, because that's how we add elements to our historic resource inventory in accordance with our code. It should also be a district. If we're paying attention to the State Historic um, Preservation Office and they do provide guidelines, and yes, I believe we should be obeying those guidelines because we are a certified local government. And if we want to continue to get grant money under CLG opportunities, then we have to abide by the guidance available to CLGs. It says that your inventory, your database is supposed to be related to the state database and the state database guidance says that a complex of buildings really should be a district and not one, it, it says that, I'll show it to you. I read this stuff, I actually do. The last piece I will say is that um, there was a, a comment that um, the owners of these properties did not require notification in this particular case. Um, I believe it came up at the Planning Commission on Monday night that the Planning Commissioners suggested that these owners should be notified. And I believe that this is a great example of when more communication with the owners of the properties where historic resources are located is appropriate. It's just a habit. I got a letter on Monday saying that my hedge has overgrown my sidewalk. Now they cited me on Thursday and I had already cleaned it up on Friday, but if they can send me a letter in the mail with the appropriate code ex excerpts copied and included in that, why can't we send the right letters to these 16 owners at Suburban Square and, and process this one properly. I think the first two sections of these could probably be passed tonight, but section three on Suburban Square, I believe you need those database entries, you need to notify the homeowners, and it needs to go through the proper processes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gillen. Is there any other public comment? Is there anyone online? There is no one with their hand raised online. Okay, so uh, in terms of response, since Ms. Gillen, since you directed one of these, th uh, one of your comments, something I had said, uh, let me just clarify. Um, 
the historic resource in, uh, inventory is not, the database is not lost. Um, in when we migrated to a new township website, um, the database became unavailable as part of the, to the public using the public website. And what I think several of us have urged, uh, not just me, and I think staff recognizes this, is that we would like to bring it back online, but it is not lost. Um, and I'm just looking at, at Greg, because if I'm misstating the situation, you can feel free to correct me in, in, in this case. Yeah, that, that's perfectly correct. And, and I'd also like to note that in the database entries, the only pertinent information is what's contributing and non-contributing. The rest is narrative description of the property, description of the history of the property. And in each of the cases of the suburban square buildings, it is just those single buildings, no other contributing outbuildings or accessory structures that would be listed. So that's, uh, we're presenting you with all of the, the information that's uh, pertinent for this. And um, I would note that um, there may be business owners within those buildings, but the entire complex is owned by a single entity. Okay. Uh, and also, what the motion is tonight that's on the table is to advertise this ordinance it's not to enact this ordinance so um there's it's certainly additional time if people need to be to find out about this and have concerns to address it to staff and to the board so are there other commissioners who would like to say anything uh else commissioner o'neill please more of, a, more of a question just for clarification to maybe members of the public um what what you're describing here isn't any subdivision of any new parcel being created as a new taxable entity what you're talking about is just an internal way to track within a parcel x number of places for identification for historic purposes I just want to make well, sure that we're not talking, there's a, that there isn't a tax implication on what we're doing this evening. No, absolutely not. Okay, thanks. Okay, anyone else? Commissioner Zella. Oh, Commissioner Grimes, you may have said this a moment ago, but uh, and I got distracted for a moment. Is it, is it the staff plan to notify all property owners? I didn't specifically ask that, so. Well, it was our uh, solicitor's determination that for this group, this phase of um, prop, uh, properties um, in, in these three sections that notification was not necessary. Now in the next phase, um, notification will be necessary for um, almost all of the properties. Notification to neighbors will be necessary in many cases. And so we wanted to tackle these three at first because um, those kinds of steps were deemed to be not necessary. Thanks for that explanation. Okay, okay. anyone else? Okay, we'll, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand and signify aye. Any opposed? See no one. Any abstentions? Okay, passes unanimously. Um, the next is on page eight of our agendas, and this is a, uh, a, a consideration of authorization to advertise an ordinance for minor uh, cleanups of the zoning code. Chris. Good evening. Um, once again, these are some of the more minor um, cleanups to the zoning code. As, as we have a new code, we keep going through it and we're finding clarifications, things that need to be refined. Um, specifically, a lot of these are coming from the zoning officer as he's going through day-to-day -day permits. We're going to first look at um, cleaning up uh, items relating to tree houses and playhouses. Um, we're also then going to clean up some areas um, bring forward um, dealing with enclosed space on existing front porches that are in the front that are already projecting into the setback um, clean up some things about awnings um, and looking at the the amount of commercial space that's going to be required in our mixed-use buildings and then adding some um, sign standards for a new uh, zoning district that was created for the neighborhood commercial in Gladwin and Penwin Um, so the first one we're dealing with is, is relating to tree houses and playhouses. Currently, tree houses and playhouses are listed as accessory buildings. Essentially, what we're going to do is change the definitions um, of accessory building and accessory structure to clearly put tree houses and playhouses as accessory structures, not accessory buildings. Why is this important? Accessory buildings can be built higher than accessory structures. 
and I'll show you some pictures a little later that indicate why we want to have tree houses be the size that we all have that picture of a tree house in our mind, not as having it just essentially a larger building. Um, so to do this, we would change the definition of accessory building, change the, um, by removing um, reference to tree houses or playhouses, adding that reference to the definition of accessory structure, creating new definitions for playhouses and for tree houses. And this is why we want to do this. This is what I think most of us have in our mind is that image of a, of a tree house. You know, something, a couple slabs of wood put up in a tree, kids are hanging up there, it's wholesome in your backyard. What we've seen in the community is a tendency towards larger structures. Um, this is just one example that's in Gladwin. Is this that is the one that Dan built for his grandkids? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's <Yeah>. my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can see by the, the children for scale. I mean, here are kids for scale, and then you come to this one. And this is an absolutely beautiful treehouse. I've been in this treehouse. It's in Gladwin. Um, it was featured in um, Philadelphia Magazine. I won't, I won't reference the gentleman's name who it was, but it was a gentleman's name and his $100,000 treehouse. It was featured almost like it was a real estate listing. Um, this is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's, but, and it might work on a, on a 10 acre property in Gladwin, but if this was on a half acre lot in Ardmore overlooking another half acre lot, it might not be appropriate. So we want to make sure that we have the appropriate standards, that these max out at 15 feet and can't um, project further. Um, it's, really just, it's really just doing it so we can regulate these as structures, not as buildings going forward. Um, the next uh, cleanup relates to um, porches that project into the front yard setback. Houses are permitted to have porches. In some districts, poor in the single family districts, porches are either non-conforming to the front yard setback and, and are legally uh, or non-conforming, or they've been permitted through a zoning code um, amendment that we made years ago that allows porches to project into the front yard setback. We were seeing in, in the mid 2000s, very large houses being built and they were very boxy. There was a lot of, we weren't getting what we like with some of that new construction. And from a township, we were asking developers to add porches. Porches are good because they add um, articulation. They help to break up the boxiness. And they're also relate to the, to the front yard. Um, developers didn't want to do this because they were losing rentable space. They were losing that, that precious square footage that they base their, their, their sales price on. So we got around that by exempting um, porches projecting in the front yard setback from impervious surface. That was what they could do. So they could still get, they could maximize their square footage, but the township could get that sense of, um, um, of articulation that made these look. And we've actually had a lot of, whether you like them or not, some of the new construction in Ardmore, they do have beautiful porches on them. And so it does really help to have that. But what we've seen is there's just needed to be clarity in the zoning code that when somebody comes forward that if you have a porch in a front yard setback that you can't build on top of it. Right? That just, we need to add a note, and that's really all this is about. So I have these three graphics showing that there's you know, a house with a porch that would be in the front yard setback, a house with a front yard with the, the porch that's behind the front yard setback, and then there's also an inset porch. What we want to be able to do is if you're a house that's in the setback and your porch is here, you can extend it up. You have the right to do that. It's just more house. You can have your porch inset underneath the house. But really what we're doing is, it, is directing to this, where you have a porch that's non-conforming non or permitted by that, that exemption in the zoning code, that we just are adding that clarity that these type of porches cannot be added and built up. They need to remain as that one story porch. That's that simple, that's the simple element of this cleanup. And just showing a couple examples that this would be an inset porch where the house was that the house was built up over top of it, but what we really want to maintain is the porch project, um, projecting out further to add that articulation. Um, the next minor set of cleanups um, deal with awnings. Um, what we've seen is from in industry standards that we should specify that um, the um, slope of porches should be one to three as opposed to two to three. It just allows um, a gentler slope um, it's more proportional and consistent with our historic districts and, our, and the scale of our streets. Um, and then the, the final cleanup in this section for zoning relates to um, what we're requiring on ground floor of new mixed use buildings. Um, there's always been this discussion that we want to activate the streetscape with the mixed use buildings. We want residential up top and then we would like to have um, the ground floor be commercial. 
And in our codes, we've indicated that the ground, active ground floor commercial use is required. But we didn't say how much. And we wanted to clarify that and really give it um, an objective standard. So what we're, set, we're adding this to be 80% of the building facade um, along the front must be, um, the primary front facade must be um, uh, commercial areas. Now, you would want them all to be, but in many cases you do need lobby space and you, need, you, might, have, um, you might have access for um, automobiles going in. But the area that is, this makes it that really if you want to have an active first floor space, 80% needs to be commercial area. So in this, because of the way our code is written, and you'll see this in your code, in, in your issues briefing, we had to update all of the tables. It's really only one change, but it's one change made to all of the tables in all of the districts. That's why it seems so long, but it really is just this one simple change. Because um, this is what we want them to look like. We don't want them to look like that, right? This is an unactive area. This meets, the, this meets our current code that it has an active use on the first floor, but we really want it to be as vibrant as this, right, on the first floor. So that's why this clarification is there. I'm happy to answer any of your questions relating to these cleanups. Oh, I'm sorry, just one last one. It's so small, I almost forgot it. Um, a couple months ago, we added um, new, um, a new targeted zoning district called Neighborhood Center in Gladwin and Penn Wynn. Um, as we went through that, we <coughs> forgot to update the sign standards. These, this district needed its own sign standards. We're just referencing it. It'll have the same sign standards as the DC district, which it was um, birthed from. Um, but it still needed to have those sign standards. So this is just that clerical adding of that into it. Now I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thanks, Chris. So, Commissioner, questions, comments? Commissioner Kramer. Last time we talked about porches, Chris, um, I raised some concern that we were putting form over function for our residents, which seems to be a chronic problem in my ward. Um, and as I'm reading the section on the enclosure of existing porches, it now says that an existing ground level, level porch located in a required rear or side setback may be enclosed under certain circumstances. And then it says that an existing ground level, level porch installed after a certain date in 2014 located in a required front or side setback cannot be enclosed. Does that mean that um, a, a porch in a front setback can be enclosed? Because there seems to be an ambiguity in the way this is written. Um, I'm not looking at the language, but I don't believe there is. I believe that this is, as I, and you caught me off guard <coughs> last time we, we brought this up. Right. The intent really is, as, as as clear this is, is if a, if a porch is in a setback and it was non-conforming, not to allow you to extend that, that non-conformity. You're really boxing out the house. What we're saying is if you have, but if you do have a porch and you want to enclose it and you're within the building envelope, you can. And that's really what we're, we're trying to do. I'd be happy offline to kind of look at that, look through the language with you. Well, I just don't really understand here because it, that isn't what the, uh, this language says here, um, and I'm sorry to be being picky uni about this, but it seems to me that an existing ground level porch located, and in, instead of saying in a required rear or side setback, it should probably say a required front rear or side setback may be enclosed, provided that these things are these conditions are met. And I think the word front is missing there. Um, I think, I want to double check this, but what we're seeing is you're seeing an excerpt of this code. You're not seeing the entire section. So okay. this is only the section dealing with projections. There are other elements that deal with, with how our code is written to what goes on within the, the building envelope. This is only dealing with the elements that, that project. But I'd be happy, I'll look at this offline and get back but, to you tomorrow on that. Okay, but because it looks to me like, the, the, it looks to me like there should be that word, mi that, that word sh French is missing from here. And if you could check on that and sure. get back, I would appreciate that. And this, this did come from the zoning officer and he felt that um, we've been over this. This is just one thing that's been a, a, a pet project of his, just to make sure that that works. We've been over a lot, so I'll, I'll we'll double check and get back to you. Tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just go around. Commissioner O'Neill. 
Oh, thank you. Um, Chris, would you like sharing the two example pictures of the of the porches? Yeah. Is that what you're going to ask? The so the the two Ardmore houses, the one I think went on spring, the the actual photographs. Oh, the actual photographs. That one. Yeah. And then the one on the right. So the one on the left, the two with the red rectangles around mm -hmm. them, those aren't protruding, right? So those are considered protruding, but you're saying we're not allowed to close up? No, I use that for, the, the reason I put that that, um, that um, picture in is to really show how if you're in the setback, you can build your porch up over top of it. That's showing living space on top, essentially live, active space on top of the porch if you were in the setback. So if you were permitted, if you were a um, conforming porch built within the building envelope and you were projecting your one story, but you come back later and you have a larger family and you need more house, you could project, you could build your house up like that. I'm just trying to, I was trying to use that as an illustration to show that. Uh, juxtaposed to the other house where there's the projection of the porch that's more of a traditional farmhouse sort of look. Correct. But if I could see the need of something very <coughs> tasteful, if the owner wanted to bump out everything, put the dormer out, put the two windows out, and that ought to be allowed. I feel like that we get nitpicky, that if somebody wanted to do that to their home, it, it doesn't affect the, the street the articulation. And perhaps these pictures are a little bit misleading. It's really, really, this is the image we should be looking at. It's that red line. It's okay. where your porch is in relation to that red line. Okay. If you're over the red line, you cannot have living space on top of it. If you're behind the red line, you can. And then my last question, not to prolong it, but do we have an inventory of the number of houses that 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 would be affected? Is it like 50-50? Is it the majority of the houses are within the setback? Like, what's the impact? Um, I, we don't. I wish we, I, we haven't done that level of survey of, of our housing stock. I would love to be have that thorough housing inventory. Um, these do come up every now and then. I mean, as we're seeing more and more, um, you know, we're seeing less and less new construction, right? We're not building new houses in the township, but people are remodeling and expanding houses. This is, this is why this is an issue. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Bernheim. Uh, uh, Commissioner O'Neill hit, hit the exact points uh, and, and question I was gonna ask, like, how often has this arisen? I mean, is this really a, a problem that needs a cure or not? We, we've had a half a dozen since the new zoning code and when you're building a bigger house relation to, to somebody else's house it's it could be a big deal yeah I, it's just unscientific the porches that I've observed that may where this may occur just you know, it didn't strike me that there would be that many of them or would be that obtrusive but I understand the point uh, I also understand uh, Commissioner Kramer's point that we might get in a little bit, uh, a little bit too much for some of the neighbors. But um, all right, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Whalen. Yes, thank you, uh, Chris. Just real quick, um, I think an addition that makes things a little cleaner in the multifamily description, mm -hmm. where previously you said active ground floor commercial use is required, you're limiting it to ground floor. Mm -hmm. By my read of the new sentence, which is a minimum of 80% of the building facade must be devoted to active ground floor commercial use, right. I would add in there a minimum of 80% of the ground floor building facade. I would say that is an appropriate amendment. Okay. I would agree with you. And that would be in like 12 places? Yeah, and that would yeah. just be throughout. In 12 places. So. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Uh, anyone else? So uh, I am going to put a motion on the table uh, thinking that we should incorporate that suggestion that you just made. Um, I, although I'm not going to read this whole thing, uh, I will move to recommend to the Board of Commissioners authorizing the Township Secretary to advertise a public hearing and notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend the Code of the Township of Lower Marion, Chapter 155, entitled Zoning, Article 2. Um, as set forth in our uh, agendas. Hopefully that's sufficient for everybody's purposes and as amended by uh, Commissioner Will and suggestion. Since we're advertising, does that work for you, Township Secretary? Um, I guess so. 
Okay. Uh, I'll second. Otherwise, I'll read it all. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Whalen. Uh, did anyone have any additional questions for we have public comment? Uh, township manager. 80% of the ground floor would prevent a building like Cricket Flats, where you have a retail in the front and parking in the rear behind the retail sections. 80% of the ground floor is a big chunk out of a mixed-use building. You are absolutely correct, but there's another provision that requires that the, that the retail only be a minimum of 40 feet. There's, there's another standard. Well, also, just to be clear, I am not, I was not suggesting a quick pest of deleting the building facade yep. or, uh, language. Yep. So, so let, maybe, maybe I'll just... So don't we end up, Chris, then with conflicting language? 80% of the ground floor in one in one section no, no, so and 40 feet in depth in the other. So if, if I can jump in, the operative word is facade. So the facade is only the front of the building that you see from the street. So I'm my amendment has nothing to do with uses inside, depths, dimensions, anything. It's just saying that so before, as it read, a minimum of 80% of the building facade must be devoted to active ground floor commercial use. That would, by my analysis, mean All the facade of the entire building, no matter how many floors you are. Right. You have to somehow take the upper residential floors and make them help the active commercial use. So you're saying 80% of the ground floor facade? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, 80% of the ground floor building facade. That's what it says. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So right. just before we, Commissioner O'Neill, one second. So when we, the motion on the table, which will eventually, if we pass it, the advertising will be done correctly is per what Commissioner Whalen just said. Right. Uh, with that and, amendment. Right. And Mr. McNeely makes a very good point, but the next sentence here, and this is why it's good to have it up on the screen, is the floor area devoted to the ground floor commercial use shall be a minimum depth of 40 feet. So it's not requiring the entire footprint to be done, but it's a good catch as you read okay. that. Okay. Commissioner O'Neill? Oh, thank you. Just curious, before we take the vote, can we redact section 2, 155, 3.6 and not vote on that one as a part of this package? 3.6? Well, the motion on the table, uh, it, what I would suggest we have a motion made and seconded if you would like to move to amend okay. uh, what I would suggest is we take any public <coughs> comment and then come back if that works for you sure. it, we can also no, wait right. until next because this is just to advertise so I don't yeah, this wanna, is a motion to advertise yeah. well but if uh, you I'm felt happy to, whichever is mo more efficient it, it, it's uh, I mean I I think it's it's cleaner to advertise what we've got here but if you you know it's your discretion if you want to put a motion on there on the table That's so why don't we go to public comment and then we'll, no, come, we'll revisit yeah, if you'd like. No problem. Thank so, you. So uh, public comment. Um. Good to see the business about accessory buildings, accessory structures, um, play houses, tree houses, those sorts of things. Um, the officers of the Federation of Civics had discussed this uh, quite a bit back in March during the Saldo rewrite, March of last year, um, and uh, got concerned about the definition of land development where we were talking about non-residential structures. And we were, um, we understood at the time that that really needed to rest under the municipal planning code, um, the, the language for land development, that the township could narrow the definition but couldn't expand it. Um, so my only point here is if we're talking about the zoning code, we need to make sure that the saldo matches it completely and that it does nest under MPC, which I, I'm assuming it does, but just as a, um, please do. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, um, as we're always talking about accessory buildings, I would love to see the community start to look at accessory dwelling units, um, some efforts toward ADUs as a way to incorporate some um, gentle density in our community to allow for affordable housing and um, perhaps a step toward working against homelessness in Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Please. Hi, Daniela Weinberg, I live in Marion. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but listening to the conversation, I wanted to speak uh, in support of Chris's amendment here regarding the porches. 
There's a reason that we have the zoning code and front setbacks. It's to protect the character and protect our natural resources and ensure that we have the consistency of our homes and neighborhoods in Lower Marion. I think it's really important that we are able to allow people to come in and speak in support of this and then make the vote. So my, um, I'm just speaking in hopes that you will vote tonight to advertise this and allow the public to come in and make comments around it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Is there anyone online? Um, no one has their hand on. Okay. So, uh, are there any other commissioner comments, questions, motions? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, can, can, can just for point of since I, I don't, I've I'm assuming, Commissioner O'Neill, that you are not making a so, motion to amend. Or I'll are you? I'll make a motion to amend oh. uh, Section 2, um, one Chapter 155, 3.6, dealing with projections. Um, hopefully, it's a friendly amendment to. Is, yes. is your motion to withdraw that to from withdraw, what's going to be to advertised? Mm -hmm. I'm not certain that I'd want to make it a friendly amendment, so I would ask if we can have a, a conversation on the amendment. Uh, Commissioner Gilda Kramer? I'll second the amendment. Okay. A motion to amend. Thank you. Um, so, is there any uh, commissioner discussion on the amendment, which is to remove 155-3.6 from the advertisement? Just as a matter of procedure, if we do that and we advertise this absent that section, when it comes forward for the board, we're not discussing it. The other, the yes. other option is that we keep it in and we discuss it at that point in time and whether there are modifications or motions to be made, we would be able to do that. I, I would That's submit that yes. might make more sense and would keep open the issues that uh, my colleagues here may, may want to address as opposed to just closing it down now. Okay. Commissioner Gilda Kramer. Uh, I, th I think perhaps that what we ought to do is is just table that section until we have some answers to the questions that because I don't think that the language is clear and I think advertising something that in my view is confusing um, isn't appropriate and I'd like to have clarification on that before I vote um, to advertise something and um, so if I, if I can perhaps make a revise the motion or, the, or make well, a different motion I'd like to see well, that section tabled until we have clarification well, from we have a well. we have we have a motion on the table okay. if this motion is defeated then we could consider another motion okay um, but right, so right now we have Commissioner O'Neill's motion uh, is there any other discussion it, on this motion just quickly oh, yeah Commissioner um, Whalen, Sean Whalen. Respectfully, Commissioner O'Neill, I'm not going to support your motion, although I do support the basis for it. I think the better option, because I want to hear some more, I want to move forward with the revisions, but I want to hear more discussion and answers about it, because I, as I read it, it was clear to me, but clearly with issues raised, it might not be as clear to me as I thought it was upon my first reading. So I will not support the motion now, but I welcome the discussion with additional commentary with Chris offline as to the details of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zeloff. Uh, I guess I need clarification. Is the motion to delete 155-3.6C or just well, C2? The, the motion was 155-3.6 from consideration, so it's the entire section. section. And oh, again, one, oh, again, okay. this All is, of, oh, yes. Okay, 155 Three points. Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any? Uh, how does the motion is to delete it? The, the conversation from Commissioner Kramer was table. How do you table a section? Well, okay. that's not well, right. it's either you accept it in or you delete it out. Well, although right. yes, good point. Although that's not. That's not what the issue at this moment. Yeah. Uh, understood. Yes. I'm just I'm looking ahead. Yes. Right. But as a point as a point of order and fairness to Commissioner Kramer is trying to say, all right, how can we sort of like have the cake and eat it too? And yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. As a matter of procedure, you can't table a section. You can move to delete it to that. Right. If that fails and it goes forward and at the risk of being redundant, then you're gonna have the opportunity 
if there's a question of language, you know, clean it up. I don't read it the same way Commissioner Kramer does, but maybe somebody can still improve it to, to satisfy the issues that she sees. Um, but we can at least move this forward um, to, you know, to address it. As my earlier comments indicated, I'm not so much in love with it to begin with, but let's, you know, get it before us. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Who has this vote? All right. So this is a vote on the motion to uh, to, uh, to amend, which would remove 155-3.6 from the advertisement. All those in favor of removing 155-3.6, raise your hand, signifying aye. Aye. One, two, three. I see three. All those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Six, I see eight opposed. The motion fails. Okay. Uh, so now we go back to the, unless there's any other motions anyone wants to put on the table, we will go back to the original motion, which is to move to advertise the entire uh, uh, ordinance as we've discussed. Uh, I will now call for a vote on that motion. All those in favor, raise your hand signifying aye. One, two, three, four, five. I see nine. All those opposed? Two opposed. Any abstentions? So the, the motion carries. Um, I don't know that we have a consent calendar for the special meeting, so I don't know that I need to ask that. Okay, we'll just move on. Um, the next is on page 24 of our uh, packets. This is a, another author uh, concerns another authorization to advertise an ordinance uh, for Chapter 101 of the Natural Features uh, Conservation, the Tree Protection Standards. Chris, okay. um, during the comprehensive plan and the, up and the subdivision code update, one thing that was constantly brought uh, forward was tree protection. It was one of those things that um, there was a lot of discussion about with all the new construction that's taking place in the township. How can existing trees be protected? Uh, I think we're all familiar with the orange construction fencing that you see around construction sites. Well, that's what's currently the standard for tree protection in the township. And as this Board of Commissioners, um, during many land developments, require, is very concerned about contractor parking. And there's always standards that contractors may not park in the neighborhood. They need to park on site. Well, sites are smaller. You have more cars, more vehicles and you have very flimsy orange fencing. And oftentimes that fencing falls down and it's very difficult. Our inspectors go by and they, it gets put up, but it gets moved. It's, it's, it's permeable fencing. So one of the things we wanted to bring forward tonight was better fencing for tree protection, right? We've just identified that that's what this is. There are, the idea of tree protection, there's a lot. We're gonna be bringing forward over the next several months um, a few other ordinances refining this, and we're going to be working with the Shade Tree Commission on refining this. But tonight, what we want to do is just bring forward some standards that help us immediately during construction sites to make sure the fencing doesn't fall down. So we've, we've taken this to the, to the Shade Tree Commission. It's been, this ordinance was developed um, by building and planning with the Township Arborist. We took it to the um, Shade Tree Commission and the EAC, and now we're bringing it to you. Um, it, some of this came out of some training that we had done. We have relationships with different institutions around the area, and one of them is Morris Arboretum. And Morris Arboretum came, and they have an urban forestry expert, Jason Lubar, and Jason came and spoke to the Shade Tree Division and the Building Division about tree protection. And we had a day-long set of training, and he presented some um, standards for this. And we're getting around to updating what we're doing to the key elements of his standards. Um, but it's really, his presentation was about that if you, d if you crush the roots of a tree during construction, you've damaged that tree. That tree is probably not going to live. And we've gone through all this effort and these big majestic trees, and then they're not going to live. And we want to be able to make the standards that they can live during it. So he pointed out that there's a, a very area of, of sensitivity around the roots. Um, the closer you get to the tree, the more important those tree roots are. Um, but they're all very important and it extends out to what we call the um, past where the drip line is. But these are just some pictures of, of what's going on out there, right? Very tight construction site. You have a, um, somebody just trying to put everything on the site. 
Um, the fencing's down, somebody moved it, and you know, somebody is the, the contractor, somebody laying down the materials isn't really thinking about the tree protection. They're just trying to get their stuff on the site. So these are coming down. Now, next time our inspector comes, the fencing comes back up, everything gets moved, but the damage is done. We're seeing other things, you know, these are just real life examples of things that are put down, um, mechanical damage of trees and just, you know, crushing of the roots going along it. You can see that, the, you know, the fencing is wrapped around that, that you see it, but it's just not acceptable. Um, once again, the fencing can be on the, out, on the outside and it looks good on the street, but as you come around, it's, um, somebody's come in through the back and they're laying things down along the tree. Um, and, these, and this tree, when, when coming forward, could be a majestic tree and we want to preserve it. We spent a lot of time doing that. So what we're proposing is better, more stand, more solid fencing. And it's going to be chain link fencing with real foundations. This is very difficult to run over. Right. You have to, you know, you have a bulldozer could run over it, but most construction vehicles can't. You can't just pick it up. It's going to be anchored into the ground. There's standards in here for digging posts by hand and, and having good solid foundations. And it's also going to have signage telling you that this is tree protection. Um, so this is really what the industry standard is. We'd like to adopt those um, arborist standards going forward. Um, we don't find it any more visually um, offensive than the orange snow fencing, and especially orange snow fencing that's falling all over the ground. This is what you need to do during construction, um, but it's most of the time it'll be um, good, solid, gauged um, uh, chain link. So in this, um, we, we're amending this, this section, um, requiring the chain link um, fencing, but it's also giving um, the township arborist um, discretion where that where the edge of it is placed and this is something we really um, had a, a healthy discussion with the um, shade tree commission about is where exactly should the edge of this fencing be around it what is it is it it's always been referred to as the standard drip line of a tree but not all trees have the same drip line in here the township arborist who looks at every one of these permits and looks at every one of these trees will determine and has the ability to say in this case because of this tree we should move the fence out further or in this case it could be moved back it could be moved in um, if other situations. So we, the township retains the ability to be flexible with this if need be. Um, and then just adding the standards in here to create and secure the tree protection zone. Um, and then also updating um, some things while we opened this up, um, establishing some areas um, for when um, tree roots are damaged or um, tree branches are damaged during construction, how they're, how they're mulched, how they're cut, and how they're healed um, during, during construction. So just updating that. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Great. Thanks, Chris. Commissioner McComb. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grimes. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the presentation. I, I think this is an excellent amendment, and I fully support it. Just a couple of questions. One is, um, what is the enforcement mechanism? So not to be cynical, but we all know that builders get in and parking is a problem, and, you know, what's to keep somebody from just cutting through, putting the truck in there for a little bit, and the next thing you know, the truck's been there for a while. They've unloaded material. And I know from personal observation that it, like a week or so of material sitting on a tree, particularly in the summer when it's in a growth period, that's enough to kill them. Yeah. So um, it would be treated as any other um, violation on a construction site. So um, we have the ability to shut down a construction site um, for this going forward. I mean, this is, a, this is gonna be serious. This is, this is part of your construction program going forward. I mean, the ultimate part is we could just shut the construction site down. There's also administrative fees that would be issued along the way. There aren't, there, we don't have the ability to, to make punitive monetary um, th um, uh, costs to somebody, and that's not really why we do it. We're trying to bring everybody into compliance, but there are administrative fees of, of um, um, upwards of hundreds of dollars and the ability to shut a job down, which is a real crippler of somebody's building house. Yeah, that, that sounds like it should be effective, and I'm hopeful that it won't necessarily come to that word. We'll get out to the um, contractors that the township's serious about this and, and that this will be a new way of doing business. But it's, it's important, and I think it's, it's worthwhile and supportive. Thank you. And to your point, we actually have many, you know, being a, a relatively small town, we have many of the same contractors who do the work in the township. So, and most of them want to do the right thing. This is the ability to really, I, I think the word will get out fairly quickly. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Sure. Commissioner Zella. Uh, no better night to be discussing this on the night that we received the sustainability plan. 
I mean, this is a time, you know, this is uh, the right thing to do. Um, and I'm glad we're doing it. Uh, Chris, you referred to the off-site parking requirement, uh, which is now standard condition uh, uh, for land development. Um, what happens when the off-site parking requirement, well, the, the non-street parking requirement is, well, we'll park on site. Can't building and planning say, no, the site is too small. You haven't met the requirements of the condition. You need to provide uh, parking for contractor vehicles that not only is not on public streets, but not on the site. Correct. And that's how we do it for land development. So in a land development, we would do that. We would have a pre-construction meeting, and we would point that out. So we would look, and would, I think everybody looking around the plan at that time would say, there just isn't time. You can't put a lot of vehicles here, and this is how you're going to do that. And we would, have a, we would come up with a plan with that. One of the problems is 95% of the construction that's taking place in the township isn't through land development. Right. It's through just building permits. And so we don't have that standard. That's not a condition that's, that's required. Um, so contractors are able to park on the street and they are able to park on the site for those. Well, can that be a requirement for uh, over-the-counter permits that are 95% that are of construction operates under? I don't know that off the top of my head. I would want to discuss that with, with, our, with our, our building director and also with um, the township solicitor. I think you should put that on your meeting yeah. schedule. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Pre Vice President Gabbard. So, got there, almost got it right. President. <laughs> Chris, you mentioned that this this is industry standard. Can you tell me more? Is that this what most have you kind of done research about other municipalities, or is this just better practice than what we currently well, have? Well, th this actually came from our friends at the Mars Arboretum. So, the Mars Arboretum, which is really the the premier um, urban arborist in the region. Um, came to us and they've done some research and they put together these best practices that they bring to municipalities. And okay. um, I've, I've known Mr. Lubar for years um, going back and he's constantly trying to update this. And I know the Shade Tree Commission has looked into this as well and there's other standards. This isn't something that other communities are facing the same issue and this is how you respond. There's, there's been techniques and that you're trying to do it. Some of them are, there's maybe some different wording on the signage or there's different footings, but essentially it's chain link fence with a good footing is the best way to stop it as opposed to orange chain uh, orange snow fence so how does it if you had a property with 20 trees on it is this going around every tree or how is i mean i'm trying to you know balance and, and it's definitely a problem right if you have cars backing into trees killing trees when they're when they're doing construction mm -hmm. on the other side if you're requiring five days worth of work to put fences around trees on a property that's also maybe incredibly burdensome right so when a permit is issued um, building staff and the and the arborists look at the permit and they, they look at the site so if you had an 80 acre site let's just, let's take it to the extreme example and you were only building up in the top corner along the street of course it doesn't make sense that the trees would be impacted you would have an area of you you would mark out the area of disturbance in the area of construction there's not there's a construction envelope and there's a disturbance area and part of that is worked out between staff and the developer or, or the builder to make sure that the, that is marked out. So it doesn't have to be around, you, you could designate entire areas, right? Like one long run fence instead of taking the fence around each sure. individual tree. So everybody tries to be practical about that. Okay. Do we know how big of a problem, I mean, obviously the picture you showed us is a problem. Is that commonplace? Does it happen once in a while? Do we not even know because we're not inspecting every single property all the time? I would challenge <laughs> to say, I'm gonna challenge anybody to find some absolutely perfectly taunt um, construction fencing in, in the township. I think, it, I think it starts to sag the minute you put it up, right? You try to put it up, you stretch it out, but it's a stretchy material. Yeah. And so it's gonna, it's gonna sag no matter what you do. Okay. Chain link doesn't seem to do that. Great, thank you. Commissioner sure, O'Neill. Just a quick question about the footings. So they're underground, right? So that will hurt the roots though. So how, what's... There's there some language I, I, in here. I support this, okay. it's super important, but I worry about the roots. As you well should. So we, we did too, and our arborists did. So we're requiring that the footings be hand dug, and you're looking at that, and then if you find a root, you adjust the footing. So if it was mechanical, you did a big hole. Oops, I found a root, but it's too late. You already dug the root out. Here, by hand digging it, you're alerted to 
oh, there's a root, we just need to move that over. Because at the same time, the contractor and the homeowner want to preserve that tree too. So this is in everybody's best interest. It's just requiring everybody to spend the time doing it. And that's why we really did try to spend the time working on this. I do want to give the Township Arborist a lot of credit for really spending the time customizing this to our local conditions. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Burns, Chris, you know what the cost is to install these things? Go ahead. Yeah. It's more, but not excessive. <laughs> Um, no, we asked, we asked somewhat the same question, um, and we ran this by our township engineer. I think from what we heard is it's, it's being done in other communities. I think it's a cost that when you're, when you're building that, that it's, it's easy to be absorbed in the construction cost. It's uh, hundreds, of, do it's hundreds of dollars. It's hundreds of dollars. I was looking for a dollar number. Per I mean, tree. Would we going to use um, uh, Vice President Gavin's example? If you've got multiple trees and you're putting these up and the materials, the labor to put that in, that, that can add up pretty quickly. So okay. I, I just didn't know if you know what the cost is for any one of these things. The the materials the materials are certainly more. Yeah. Um, the labor's a little bit more. But at the same time, you're um, on a construction site having to constantly put the construction fencing up and stopping the job to get somebody over there. So I wouldn't say that the labor is necessarily any more. But I would say the materials might be a little bit more. But at the end of the day, there's actual value built into this because the tree is protected and the job probably goes a lot smoother. All right. I'm not getting a dollar value, but thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm just going to build on because I had the same question, Commissioner Bernheim. But uh, it, uh, if you don't know this for tonight, that's fine because we're advertising it. But is this something you could walk into Home Depot or Lowe's or Gladwin Hardware and get this kind of chain link fence? <laughs> Yeah, it's a rel it's uh, commercially available. It's commercially okay. available. So you don't have to special order. <laughs> Correct. Okay, thanks. Like, well, you know, <laughs> How much well, is although that is in Ward One. Um, so, anyone else with any questions or comments? So, I am going to make a motion to recommend to the Board of Commissioners authorizing the Township Secretary to advertise notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend Chapter One Hundred One. Natural Features Conservation to add a definition for tree, tree protection zone and to amend Article 11 minimum conservation standards to provide specific standards for the protection of vegetation from mechanical injury, grading change, and excavation. Thank you for the second, Commissioner Zelov. Uh, we will now open this for public comment. Does anyone have public comment on this matter? Sir, if you can come right up. Commissioners, good evening. My name is Joe McNeil. I live in Ardmore. Um, first of all, this is fantastic. We are bringing forward substantive uh, measures to uh, have tree protection um, when sites being disturbed by construction. So that is great. Uh, and I agree that uh, these kind of bomb-proof fences, as described by Jason Lubar, and I was at the same uh, meetings as Chris was uh, referencing, are absolute required. Um, unfortunately, I think some more work still needs to be done on the amendment to the Natural Features Code. Uh, for example, the tree protection zone is being defined as the drip line only. Uh, there should be allowances in, in the code itself and not just discretion of the Township Arborist. So um, there's um, transparency with individuals preparing plans, for example, that the tree protection zone can be defined, uh, for example, as the critical root zone as well. And that's important because uh, in examples where trees, for example, grew up uh, in clusters and wooded areas, their drip line may be quite tiny uh, compared to the spread of their roots that are structural roots because they had to grow more vertically to compete for sunlight uh, with other trees. In this case, the tree protection zone would be one foot per inch DBH, matching the ANSI A300 standards. And that kind of goes into the next concern I have, and that is we should talk about the standards that are the industry standards uh, for tree care uh, in the ordinance. So that's ANSI A300. Um, there are other measures that uh, should be uh, incentivized, should be proposed in the ordinance, including incentivizing 
uh, tunneling under tree roots in the tree protection zone, uh, tunneling under, say, for example, three feet under most of the structural roots and the top two feet uh, around trees. So if you're under three feet, you avoid them altogether. Uh, so that's something not in the proposed ordinance. So there are other issues uh, I would bring up. I would say Chris, uh, happy uh, he attended the Shade Tree Commission meeting uh, last month. Unfortunately, we did not have a quorum and we weren't able to provide an official uh, recommendation. Uh, my understanding is we will have that um, quorum <laughs> uh, at our next meeting, which is next Tuesday. And this will be uh, something that we look uh, we look at. I did provide public comment earlier today uh, with some substantive changes to the proposed ordinance, and uh, that's an example of uh, maybe it's premature right now to consider the amendment. Uh, however, this is such an important topic, and I do hope that um, one. I I don't think this is ready just yet, but I hope that will be ready for your meeting next month. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McNeil. We, we also did get your written comments, uh, and they've been distributed to commissioners. Uh, is there any other public comment on this matter? Okay. Um, seeing none, before we uh, come back, uh, Chris, I don't know if you would, do you have any response, please? Yeah. Um, I appreciate Mr. McNeil's comments. Um, we do go to Shade Tree Commission, and as, as we look at it, let's not let the perfect get in the way of the good, right? We have trees, we have, we have trees, we have construction sites right now. If we pass, if we move forward with this ordinance now, as written, it will save trees. We can continue to work with the Shade Tree Commission and refine the ordinance, and really what Mr. McNeil is talking about is um, where the definition of, where the, where the edge of the fence is, right? That's a very technical aspect. I think you have enough and we have enough on the books with this ordinance to move things forward and make things better. We can continue to make it better, but let's not let the, the perfect get in the way of the good. Uh, I recommend adopting, uh, advertising this ordinance tonight. And, and, and if I may, uh, Chris, in case you know this because you bring up a relevant point, uh, if the board votes to advertise this tonight and we vote at the special board meeting, this ordinance could be enacted uh, this summer. Right. Otherwise, my understanding, if we don't advertise it tonight, it has to wait into the fall because of the timing of notification requirements. Is that correct? That would be correct. Okay. So, uh, other commissioner questions, comments? Commissioner uh, McComb. Thank you, Commissioner Just a quick question. Um, one on one dash six says that the underlying language in all cases, the township arbor shall have the authority to specify appropriate measures necessary for tree preservation. Doesn't that give uh, Joe Marco, some discretion to to adjust the, the for example, I, I'm not really I understand what Mr. McNeil said about the critical root zone. But I'm not sure that provides much guidance to the Correct. contractor, whereas I think um, Joe Marco really could provide that guidance based on his observation and knowledge. Correct. Instead of having a, a the we have a standard and, and, and on top of that we have the authority of the person who's reviewing the, the permit himself who's going out and familiar with the tree and the site to actually do that. So, I mean, Mr. Our Township Arbors looks at all the sites while he's issuing this, so this isn't just done in, in the back of a room. This is really in relation to the hands-on And that's where we feel we have a lot of discretion in the way this is done, um, to be able to do it to make sure that we get it right. Right, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rice. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bernheim. Yeah, if I can just follow that, it's like, you know, a two-edged sword, you know, you have Know, almost blanket authority, but having that blanket authority, some leaves the ability to challenge it. So I don't know if there's, um, because this is well outside of my zone of comfort of, of commenting on the substance. And I know Commissioner McCombs, you know, one of several is very familiar with this, having spent some time in shade tree. If there's any standards that can be put in here for guardrails on that. Well, we do have, we do have the definition of, of tree root zone, which is the pretty much the industry standard that it's the common area where you're the, the drip line of the of the tree is. So we know where we're doing this. It's not arbitrary where the township arborist is starting his piece, where he's going to say this is where the fencing needs to go in. What it gives him is flexibility at that line to adjust it if 
perhaps there's piping, perhaps there are other trees. Um, it really gives them the flexibility to adjust to on-site conditions. Yeah, it's just the language, in all cases the township arborist shall have the authority to specify appropriate measures necessary for tree preservation, just erase everything else. I mean, that's, that's my concern. So, yeah, I just don't know if there's a way to refine that, that at all. I mean, I understand the need for flexibility because, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation and you, you, you don't want to have to come back to the board each and every time and yeah. have us have no idea what we're talking about and have the arborists do it. Um, all right, well, just maybe, you know, we're going to vote to advertise this. Maybe we can figure out some other language in there because some of the points that I heard seem fairly valid. Thank you. Sure. Right. Commissioner Zellot. Um, thanks, Commissioner Grant. Yeah, I agree that the points that I heard from Mr. McNeil sounded valid. So uh, I also understand we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So you said, Chris, we'll, we'll, we can amend in the future. So can you put a little, middle, little meat on that bone? What's what you're thinking of the time frame? Well, what we've asked Mr. McNeil to do, and I've, I've been to the Shade Tree Commission, and he's been to the AC, and we've been frankly doing this for, for two months, to put in writing what his standards are. Right. I've, we've, had, we've had conversations at meetings, but what we want to know is an analysis from the Shade Tree Commission. Now, Mr. McNeil's up here as an individual, not as, a mem not as the Shade Tree Commission, saying specifically how this standard impacts and makes trees safer. He's referencing an industry standard. Well, put that, in, that standard in writing, explain to us, and we can sit and say, how is that standard better than what we have here? Let's, let's look at that, let's evaluate it. Sure, it sounds great at a meeting, we all agree to that, but without testing it, we don't, we don't know. He's referencing just a, a secondary standard as opposed to what's written in the ordinance. So that's why we would spend time at the Shade Tree Commission to do this. But this would be something we were gonna spend months with with the Shade Tree Commission, and to Mr. Commissioner Grimes' point of view, if we tabled it, suppose we tabled this tonight, we wouldn't bring this back till well into the fall. And it will make, will it make it 5% better? Will Mr. McNeil's comments make it 5% better? 95% of it, of this is in getting hard construction fencing with solid footings and signage in the ground. Yeah, I understand your, your, the point you made at the end of your comments, and I'm going to support this. But I'm just asking, and, and you've, you've stated you're looking for some more information from the Shade Tree Commission, and that makes sense. Yeah. So when and if you get that, then do you, where does this fit in, the, in your thinking about coming back to us? Well, I think right now the, the, the balls in Mr. McNeil's court to, to send the arborist and, and planning staff his analysis of those mm -hmm. standards, we would evaluate them and go back to the next Shade Tree Commission. We, we, as I said, we're committed to going back to those meetings and, and continuing this discussion. Tree protection is something we take very seriously. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you. Um, similar area in question here. This is the same sort of paragraph that um, Commissioner Bernheim was talking about with respect to the arborists, um, I guess, the breadth of responsibility over a decision about um, tree protection. And it says that in all cases, the township arborist shall have the authority to specify appropriate measures necessary. I find that to be very inflexible language, and I feel like that is more of a unilateral, almost slight against one of our advisory boards, so that they, it effectively reads that they have no say, and at no time does the arborist even have to consult with anybody else before making a decision. And I wonder whether we could, maybe we ought to soften that a little bit to allow for at least dialogue because um, right now it's not written as any dialogue necessary. So the, I worry a little bit about that. So where this code applies to is a, is a building permit, a grading mm -hmm. permit, right, when construction's happening. The Shade Tree Commission has no authority over a grading permit. Their authority That's is no authority within the public right-of-way dealing with, with shade trees. So construction on private property is, is, outside, of their, is outside of their purview. Advisory boards are not consulted on building permits. The township arborist is trained, he's familiar, and this is what he does. He's, he's in, we're fortunate to have a very, very good township arborist. Um, 
it's it's something it's really at the matter of on site much like we would have a building code official right so a house is being framed and somebody's making the call from one of our building code officials they're looking at that with that same level of training and familiarity with the site to do that okay i can't support this because of that it's too stringent okay Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner McKeon. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I have two questions on this. We just touched on um, Shade Tree Commission, Shade Tree Division. Um, so Shade Tree uh, Division is a division under public works. If, when you're talking about enforcing these standards, that would actually be the Building and Planning Division, right? That would go to uh, the code enforcement for trees? Uh, it's, a, it's a team effort. Okay. So when, there's a lot of eyes on construction sites. So originally when the permit first comes forward, it's reviewed by, um, planning staff and it's also reviewed for the tree protection from the township arbor so it's 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 multi um, departmental on in the, and then as building sites are, are up building inspectors are looking at that and enforcing sites the town they're, they're within building site. and planning right? correct yep. and also the township engineer we have inspectors from the township engineers office that are in the field but then the township arbor is also driving around all day I mean, that's what everybody's doing and everybody's looking at these sites as they're going around so there's a lot of eyes on these and what we're also putting into this is signage. Right? So there's going to be a sign on the construction fencing that says is there a violation, call the township. So you know how to do that. A lot of times we've had, in, we've had issues with residents who are concerned about an infill development in their neighborhood and losing a big tree that's in the neighborhood. Construction fencing's falling down and they don't, they don't know who to contact. They don't know how to do that. So we're trying to make that reporting of violations much easier as well. All right, and in the time I've been on the board, a lot of times when we'll uh, propose, well, when an ordinance will be proposed, there'll be some pushback that this isn't perfect yet. Uh, we should tweak it. We need to still work on it. It's nine, you know, ninety-five percent there, and at that point, we have, the, we have the option of either voting for it and then maybe amending it later on, mm -hmm. or not adopting it and, and working on it and bringing it back. I think oftentimes when um, we don't vote for it, and we bring it back later on. It's because we're worried about the unintended consequences of passing something. Right. Do you see any dangerous unintended consequences of passing this ordinance as, as it's written tonight? I do not. I just see trees being protected. Okay. Oh, all right. Good enough for me. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we will call the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand, signifying aye. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ten. All any opposed? Two opposed. Any abstentions? So the motion carries. Um, thank you. The the last item on our agendas for building and planning tonight is on page thirty one. This concerns an authorization to advertise an ordinance uh, concerning Chapter One Nineteen, the Real Estate Registry. Chris. I've been trying to um, uh, script tonight's uh, presentation so they get easier as we go on with less discussion. So let's hope this one's the easiest one to get us out of here tonight. Um, as we were going through the code, we, we look at various chapters. And this is a chapter that we rarely look at. And I don't know if it's ever been brought before the Board of Commissioners, dealing with real estate registry. This is when a house is sold or when you record a plan. And we noticed um, that it needed to be updated to show the unique identifier with the county this goes back to currently on our code it's requiring an address to be added and we're adding we're just suggesting that you also add in the unique county identifier to that that's with your your tax number um, we now have GIS and we have computerized methods and what we're essentially doing is updating this requirement to reflect that okay thank you Mr. Bernard um, Clearly, every seller ought to tell the purchaser the tax ID number because that's going to eliminate a number of problems when they go to pay taxes and they've got some errors. There's just a multitude of those problems. The difficulty I have is the implementation of this. The way it reads, it shall be unlawful for an owner to sell a property or interest therein. I'll stop for a second if they don't have, among other things, that tax ID number. Well, it should be, you know, okay. You sh some penalty, some way to do that. But it also indicates it would be unlawful to purchase it if the seller hasn't given it. There are easily scenarios that I can think of where a property is being sold, the seller doesn't disclose it, the 
purchaser doesn't know it's supposed to be disclosed. And what this is stating is you can't record the deed and the purchase hasn't gone through and maybe there's been some financing with it. And all of a sudden you have an entire transaction but, but for the tax ID number having been given from seller to purchaser, we're saying the deal cannot be recorded. That's a problem. The tax ID number is publicly accessible from the, from the county offices. It's, it's not a hidden... It, it's, it, right, this isn't a big lift, right? right. It, but the reason we're doing this is because on occasion it does not occur. And what I'm saying is that we're now, you know, I, I did not even know that if you didn't have the right street number you know, according to the way this is drafted, you wouldn't be able to record a deed, right? Or you couldn't, per it says it's then unlawful to purchase it. So you go to a closing, you have a deed, you have a mortgage, whatever, whatever it may be. And we're saying, well, that's great, but it's all um, unlawful. The transaction can't be recorded. It's as if it didn't occur. We, we need to be able to make the requirement, but not preclude the transaction. I think that's the enforcement, though. Isn't well, the enforcement right, that I know, but what the, the enforcement is, you know, potentially a greater problem than the issue we're trying to address. We're, we're potentially creating a bigger problem than, you know, just, tran you know, having somebody give the tax ID number. You know, we can require, most title companies are going to do that anyway. It's going to be there. So it's those very few situations where there are transactions without title companies, private individuals, other transfers that take place where you're going to have less sophisticated sellers and purchasers that are going to make this error. Follow what I'm saying? Thus, the penalty that we have by, in essence, voiding that transaction is not, we need another mechanism in order to go ahead and enforce this. For example? Well. Well, you can declare it unlawful. You can declare that the seller gets, you know, some monetary penalty, but you don't void the transaction. Or I think what we've done in this case is just delay the transaction until the information is provided. It's really no. just, it's, we're okay. looking at this very much as a clerical, it's, it's much like filing, you know, any sort of permit or filing your taxes in the township. We are essentially, you know, from a township perspective, clerks, right? We're collecting things. We're making sure the paperwork is up to date here. Yeah, I, I understand. But what we've drafted says it shall be unlawful for any owner to sell his property or an interest therein or for a purchaser to acquire the property. Right. That's not new language. That's I, I know, but, but, that's which is why I said language. 60 that's seconds ago this was news, you know, new to me. Had I known that before and just those other issues, maybe I would have said we, we should address that. But the fact that we recognize there's obviously some problem without giving out those tax ID numbers that we need to address is it's come forward. So we, I believe that we can find a mechanism to try to enforce and try to coerce, so to speak, that fundamental aspect of sellers making sure that purchasers have the tax ID numbers because we want that again. It makes it easier for everybody in paying taxes. But this as a penalty for it is probably I will offer you a, a, a similar, I will offer the, 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 a contrast to that. Actually, this came up because a seller from a subdivision, the pro, he was trying to do this so fast, he was trying to close by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. He had a um, large property and was subdividing it. He was ahead of our ability, to, the township's ability, to issue addresses. Right? We hadn't issued the addresses. So if we could, in this case, have the tax ID number, which the county had already done when the, when the property was recorded. As soon as the property is recorded, that tax ID number was generated. Right. So that was easier to do than doing, than going to the township offices where we hadn't processed that yet. Yeah, uh, mechanically, this shouldn't be difficult for anybody, but obviously there are those scenarios where it doesn't occur, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Right. And again, at the risk of being redundant, my concern is that what we're doing is we're voiding an entire transaction because of an oops. And we can't, I don't think that that's the proper way of handling this in order to make sure it happens. Again, when, they, when you have the title companies preparing the deeds and everything else, it's right there. And I would have to assume that, you know, 90 some odd plus percent of the time, this isn't an issue. So if we're trying to address that small percentage where it is an issue, we need to have a better mechanism of trying to, you know, 
enforce it without voiding the transaction. Yeah. So you're raising a larger issue of looking at the entire section, which we hadn't done. We were yeah, just really right. making that that um, addition to it. Um, that would be something I'd, I'd, we'd need to go back to the township solicitor and look uh, at that. Sure, he's uh, no doubt more creative than I am. I, I'm spotting the problem, not identifying the best solution. Yeah. But from a municipal standpoint, really from our permitting, our as you know, somebody who processes permits, our basic go-to is completeness. Right? So this is what we're trying to say is, you, much like a building permit. If you don't have a complete building permit, we can't issue it. You don't give us, it's not complete, we can't issue it. Look, I, I, I'm 100% with you about trying to make sure that this occurs. Uh, it's just by voiding that transaction, that's what I find problematic. And there's got to be a better way of doing it. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gilda Kramer. I am still sort of struggling to see what is the absolute necessity for requiring this. And I would appreciate it if you could explain. I understand that you've had an instance where you did, couldn't have, you had a tax ID number, but you didn't have a street number yet. But is there any other reason why this should have to be provided? We were trying to make it easier. We were honestly I mean, trying to make it easier. We felt that it makes it at the recording there is a unique identifying number generated with at the recording of a, of a new property. I think this is more likely to happen with a subdivision than just, just a simple transfer. I mean, um, are, are any other systems besides the tax collector systems using this tax ID number for anything? This, this ID number is used by the police department, the fire department, the building department. Um, it's where if you have a 911 call, it's, it's the guts of that call that gets you to where you are with modern GIS. It's the unique identifier tracking number for, for a parcel of land. But do you think that people are going to use this parcel number when they call 911? They don't, I mean, but it's a, you don't, I mean, right, you I, don't refer to your, your, you don't refer to it, but it's that I number that's baked into everything in the systems that are working around you. Okay. Because it just, for instance, how many Bryn Mawr Avenues are there in, town, in Lower Marion? Right? We have how many Conshohocken and State Roads? Right? There are different elements that, I mean, I know I've gone to pick my daughter up on Conshohocken State Road and wound up in Penn Valley when she was really in, in Bala Kinwood. Right? I would just put it in Google and went to the wrong one. So physical addresses can often be misleading, but that unique number isn't because it's a unique number. So we're just trying to clarify that and make it easier. I'm still struggling to see how, on a day-to-day -day basis, this is going to make it any easier for anybody to have this number. I mean, you can just go onto the county website, and you can do a search by the property number, and you can pull up the, the tax parcel ID number if you ever need it. So I'm just trying to understand what is the value of having this requirement. Well, I think before we've always had it just as a street address, right? But with street addresses changing, as I, as I mentioned, there can be the same street address in different parts of the township. The same, you know, there's a lot of main streets in many different towns. Street, they're not unique. Street addresses themselves are not unique. But the unique um, parcel identification number is, it's how things are tracked. It's just, we, we're thinking of updating the bookkeeping moving forward. But bookkeeping for what? to how actually these are tracked with the, with the tax assessor now, which is unique tax ID number. That's what we're, that's what we're putting into this. Commissioner Grimes, could, could I make a motion to table to me have the opportunity well, to consult with our solicitor on, on this and uh, maybe answer some of these questions and address the broader yeah. aspect of it? Because there it, it, isn't it, like it, the same it, it, proper, the, And I mean this respectfully. Yeah. I don't know that Commissioner Kramer was finished her oh, comments. Well, my, my no, problem. I'm just... Yeah. I, I mean, I'm very familiar with how the tax collector uses <laughs> these numbers. Um, I do understand that, that our tax collector uses these numbers, but I don't see how these numbers are used by anybody else and why it would be required since the tax collector gets all of these tax numbers from the county um, and there isn't any reason why he would go to the deeds to pull them off the deeds. 
I am just struggling to see what is the value added from adding this requirement. Well, I think you'd be consistency. So I'm not, we were really just trying to make this easier, but I mean, we're in a, this is a good spirited discussion. I'm just I think when, just when you talk about your tax ID and you take, when you're paying your taxes, it's linked to your specific property, right? So if you live at 8 Conchahawken State Road in Gladwin, in Gladwin you want to make sure that you're not paying the, the taxes for 8 Conchahawken State Road in, in Penn Valley, right? But the, the there tax could be, bills. You want to make sure that you have that unique number so when you're transferring the property, it's just consistency between that. It's a real estate transaction, much like but when you're paying the tax taxes, this is when you're selling the your property. The tax bills include this information on the tax bill. And I don't understand how having it as part of a transaction helps anybody. It, 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 I don't want, I don't mean to signal okay. that you should, okay, fine. It's so fine. Let, let me do this because I have a feeling that uh, Commissioner Bernheim would like to offer a, uh, a, a motion, but knowing that since he signaled it, are there any other commissioners before we do that who have not yet been heard, who had questions on this and who still would like to say something knowing what Commissioner Bernheim's going to suggest? All right, Vice President Gabbard. Thank you, Commissioner Grimes. I'm a little confused how this is controversial. Um, Chris, a question that I have is, let's say a transaction, they didn't list this information on the transaction. Would the transaction be voided or would somebody say, hey, you got to put this on and they put it on and then the transaction would move forward? It's just delayed. It's delayed until the, right. the form and is it, properly, completely filled out. Right. And, and I think it's not our roles. And I, I think, Commissioner Kramer, you have a unique insight into the tax collector, but we don't, you know, none of us have insights into how building and planning is working on a day to day basis, how police are working, how fire is working. If, if our staff is saying this is a helpful piece of information to have, adding this piece of information into, you know, transactions isn't a big deal and shouldn't be a big deal. I, I think we should kind of pass this. This is something that our staff says we need and we move on. It's not going, there's no negative consequence in my mind of, you know, there, there aren't going to be voided transactions. I'm going to say, please come back with this one piece of information that's missing. So that's, that's my take on this so I I'd like to move forward with it but you know that's that's my take May okay I how that hold, on, hold on so let's do this mm -hmm. I now see I think three other commissioners who would who would um, like to make comments I understand that you would like to be recognized but in fairness no, 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 because no, we discussed the, the I I'd like to give them an opportunity so uh, let, Commissioner Stevenson I know has been waiting patiently so <laughs> thank you um, and I only and then my question is different a little different It's about um, number one the zoning and use classification and that is the question about um, you know in my ward and other places of historical districts is uh, are you also saying that they are going to when you say zoning and use classification is that a part of the requirement that you're, you're asking to make sure they include in that when it's designated as a historical, it's a good point. I didn't think it was. It should be added. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is just the standard information yeah. that's that's required. So it, 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 it pertains equally to all properties. Yes, and and that, that's what, that's what I thought. But and I guess what I'm I'm saying is, since this has come up, um, whether it's if it moves forward, I would hope that planning, building and planning could um, consider. The adding that as a part of the, this requirement because I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot of times is folks who have purchased inf um, properties um, have until they do construction or something else didn't realize it was and I think this would be helpful. Commissioner Stevenson we've talked about this for, for 15 years and never have done it this is the time to actually bring that up that's actually or you could just sit out those postcards <laughs> All the more reason to bring this back on. Right. All right. Thank you. Right. Um, I think Commissioner Whalen, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'll be very brief because I think we're going to extend this. Um, I think there are significant and numerous issues with this ordinance as a whole, let alone with what we're discussing discussing tonight. I think what Commissioner Stevenson said is absolutely correct. We should, if we're adding, if we're amending this, add historical designation, if any. 
um, requiring the zoning and use classification, just as an example, that's required by state law. So having it in our local ordinance is meaningless. Um, it's already required. The big issue that I will just point out that I think we need to talk to our solicitor about is requiring that no deed be registered by the township uh, puts the entire onus on the purchaser. Because if you think logistically, all the money has already transacted. The money is gone, the seller is long gone. Frequently sellers are not even local. Um, you know, and so if we're talking about business transactions, well, business, commercial business people under the law are allowed to do whatever they want contractually and they're allowed to get lawyers, not lawyers. And therefore, we're not really worried about protecting them, I assume. I assume what we're talking about here is smaller individual single family home transactions and the like. And there, what you're talking about is a generally unsophisticated, from a real estate perspective, purchasing. And they're already a deficit. They're required to get title insurance. Um, I'm not really sure that much of this ordinance is appropriate, but uh, putting the entire onus on the owner who has a, not to be able to record a deed, which is only a negative to them and has nothing to do with the seller. And I would say in uh, Philadelphia, this is a major place where you see all of these thefts of properties where somebody doesn't get their deed recorded right away and somebody else runs in and records something. Tangled title leads to a decade of litigation. So. Was that a commercial, Commissioner Will? <laughs> no, I uh, <laughs> do, do not do <laughs> tangled title. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I yes, didn't mean I, to minimize your comments, but thank yeah. you. I think they're well taken. Uh, Commissioner McComb. Yeah, I want to believe in the issue. I, I tend to agree with um, Vice President Gabbard that it's, it's fixable. I think you could fix it by saying, taking out the it shall be unlawful part, but I, it sounds as if there are a bunch of concerns raised by my colleagues um, in terms of tangled title and other things. So if that's the case, then I, I, I wouldn't oppose a motion to uh, table it and take a further look, although I kind of think that we may be making a bigger deal about this than it warrants. But. Okay, thank you. So, Commissioner Bernheim, thank, thank, thank you, you for much. being patient. And, and, and Commissioner Cohn, you're spot on is how you fix it. You get rid of the unlawful part. And, and Vice President Gavin, let me explain to you exactly what the problem is. And the scenario I'm going to give you is a common one. It's not a, a one-off type situation. Keep in mind that a judgment against an individual or, or husband, wife, is a lien on real estate that they own in the county in which that judgment's recorded. Day one, seller transfers or thinks they've transferred to purchaser, but oops, they don't have the tax ID number. We've declared that unlawful. Day two, a judgment's now entered against seller. That now becomes a lien on the property that the purchaser has just acquired because we've stated that the transaction's unlawful until they correct it maybe on day three. There is a better way to do it to avoid that scenario. The number of times that there are closings and their problems that occur and their intervening judgments that come up are significant. So that's why I say that example would be a real live one and you know that could occur and we've now created a greater problem than, than we solved. So Commissioner McComb, I think you're exactly where I believe our township solicitor will end up stating get rid of this as being an unlawful um, you know, e event, at least as to the purchaser, making it clear that the deed can be recorded in, in, the, in the county where it's got to be recorded, and then we can impose whatever fines. That way we can accomplish, I think, Chris, what you're looking for and remove the, uh, the, the problem that uh, I'm pointing out. So I would make a motion that we table it, allow our solicitor to come back. There's no time urgency, you know, on, on doing this. And we can, you know, hopefully correct this, you know, or address it quickly. Thank you. Is that a second, Commissioner yes. Kramer? Okay. So we have a motion to table and a motion that, and that motion is seconded. Um, is there any discussion on no. this motion? Really not supposed Zella? to want a motion to table, well, but. I want to underscore Commissioner Stevenson's very important comments about historic designation. Yes, I, I Thank agree. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank my you. Colleague. So. Um, <laughs> Seeing nothing else, we will call the vote on the motion to table. All those in favor, please raise your hand, signifying aye. 
Is there any opposed? No one opposed, any abstentions? The motion carries. So, uh, Vice President Gavrin, that concludes the business of the Building and Planning Committee. Thanks a lot, Commissioner Grimes. Um, the least controversial. We will now call to order the June 7, 2023 special meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Township of Lower Marion. All please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, if you would be so kind as to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Courtney and Mr. Sinai have asked to be excused. Mr. Bernheim. Present. Mr. Churchill. Here. Mr. Gavin. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Grimes. Here. Ms. S. Kramer. Here. Ms. G. Kramer. Here. Mr. McComb. Here. Mr. McKean. Here. Ms. O'Neill. Here. Mr. Stevenson. Present. Mr. Whalen. Here. Mr. Zello. Here. Mr. Vice President, Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, before we get into what we'll comment, one thing um, on the agenda at the top, it says Special Board of Commissioners, Todd M. Sinai, President. For, as we've heard tonight, please cross that off and write Andy Gavrin, uh, <laughs> Acting minutes, President. The minutes <laughs> acting like a president. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start with public comment. This is a section of our He's meeting where members of the public may address the board on any agenda items, which are the items uh, referred tonight from the Sustainability Committee and the B&P Committee. Uh, meetings held earlier this evening. Please keep comments to three minutes or less. If there is a group of people in the room, which doesn't look likely, uh, who are speaking on the same topic, we ask that a spokesperson be selected to address the board and that they keep their comments to five minutes or less. Comment will first be taken from those present in the room and then from those attending virtually. Please use the podium to my right and speak directly into the microphone. Obviously, that's for those present in the room. Uh, for those on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to speak during public comment. And for all members of the public speaking, please introduce yourself, uh, your name and where you live prior to uh, your comments. If you're making comments this evening, please be aware that the board and when appropriate staff will respond to comments and questions after all the public comment on a topic is finished. So if anyone in the room uh, happens to have any public comment, please approach the podium. Laura Gillen, Haverford. I want to speak on the item um, referred to the Board of Commissioners from Building and Planning regarding um, the uh, ordinance to amend Chapter A180, Historic Resource Inventory. It does seem that Mr. Pritchard and I have a um, difference of opinion on the value of those database entries. Um, I have read probably, I don't know, a half a dozen or more um, of those, and I do believe they go well beyond simple address and minimal description. I think there's a wealth of information and insight, um, the architect, the year built, but the descriptions that actually explain clearly why such a resource is deserving of protection. And I think that's really important. To me, that database entry is the codification of your thoughtful review of that resource and why it deserves protection. Um, as a matter of process, I think it probably makes the most sense for that database entry to be developed in draft through the um, Historical Commission's review as they're um, looking at a potential resource to be added to the inventory and making their recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. But regardless of my opinion versus Greg's opinion, you have to still follow the code. And the code says that the resources are more fully described in the Township's Historic Dat Resource Database. So you, to change the code, you actually have to follow the code, um, and the code references the database. So the database entry really ought to always be part of any ordinance to change the inventory. Um, it can't simply be filled in after the fact by staff, which I believe is the current process. I do understand the idea of working through these proposed changes in series. I don't know why the Suburban Square additions need to be done this summer rather than waiting for the fall and doing this properly with those database entries. Um, but that said, perhaps in this case, the required database entries um, for the, um, those historic resources could potentially be provided at the time of the hearing, um, the, the hearing to adopt and um, maybe that would be a solution. But I, you gotta have the database entries in order to change the inventory. It's very clear from our own code. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gillen. Uh, seeing no other comment in the room, uh, Madam Secretary, is there any online comment? No. Seeing no comment online. Um, any response to public comment? 
Seeing no response, um, we will move on to the uh, Sustainability Committee, and I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, receiving the Sustainability Plan, which was Draft 2.0, dated May 31, 2023. Do I have a second? Thank you, Commissioner Gilda Kramer. Um, any comment from the board on that? Seeing none, uh, any public comment? No, we already had public comment, seeing none. Uh, I was just checking if you were paying attention, Madam <laughs> Secretary. Uh, I will now call it for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Seeing how everyone raised their hand, there is no opposed, and that passes unanimously. Thank you. We have three items from Building and Planning as the, as the fourth was uh, tabled. Um, so first, I would like to make a motion for approval to authorize the township secretary to advertise a public hearing and notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend the code of the township of lower marion chapter a 180 historic resource inventory to modify listed addresses by correcting spellings and other minor errors to improve consistency with the township's official address listing to remove duplicate redundant and inactive addresses and to add specific addresses in suburban square do i have a second I can't second my own. Thank you, Commissioner Churchill. Uh -huh. um, any comment from the board? Or from the staff. Or from the staff. Yeah, can I just say briefly? Um, mm, sure. I appreciate Ms. Gillen's comments and providing those entries before the hearing is something we'd be glad to do. Great, thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Seeing how everyone raised their hand, I'll ask if there's any opposed, but that would be weird. Seeing no opposed, all right, that carries unanimously as well. Next motion is going to be slightly longer, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to make a motion for approval to authorize the township secretary to advertise a public hearing and notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend the code of the township of Lower Marion, chapter 155, entitled Zoning Article 2 Definition, section 155-2.1, definition of terms to revise the definitions for accessory building and accessory structure, and also create definitions for playhouse and treehouse. Article 3, General to District, Section 155-3.6, Projections, Subsection C, Porches, comma, to prohibit the erection of living space or balconies above existing enclosed porches, erection of living space or balconies above existing enclosed porches. Article 3, General to District, Section 155-3.6, Projections, Subsection D, uh, awnings to revise the maximum permitted slope for awnings to two to three rise awnings to revise the maximum permitted slope. I, I don't know, I'm reading myself over. We got it. We got it. Rise over run article five uses table 5.3 use regulations to revise the requirement for active ground floor commercial for multifamily, small multifamily, large mixed use and row house where applicable within the VC, TC1, TC2, NCLI, RHR, BMV1, BMV3, BMV4, CAD-RCA and CAD-BV districts to now require a minimum of 80% of the ground floor building facade to be devoted to active ground floor commercial use in Article 9 sign standards, Table 9.1, permitted sign locations and permit type to include standards for the NC district. Can I have a second and a beer, please? Thank you, Commissioner McComb. Uh, any commissioner or staff comment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? All right, you got that, Madam Secretary? Yeah. Excellent, and I will make one more motion, uh, which is a motion for approval to authorize the Township Secretary to advertise notice of intent to adopt an ordinance to amend Chapter 101, Natural Features Conservation, to add a definition for tree protection zone and to amend Article 2, Minimum Conservation Standards, to provide specific standards for the protection of vegetation from mechanical injury, grading change, and excavation. Do I have a second? Thank you, Commissioner McComb. Any commissioner or staff comment? Seeing none, we'll call it for a vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? All right, that also carries. And I believe that uh, finishes our business of the Board of Commissioners. We are officially adjourned. All right. Thank you. Thank you.